Welcome back. We're going to be talking today about general principles of interrupts, an important topic for any type of microprocessor, but particularly those that are well connected to the real world or do real-time processing. So we're going to look at what is an interrupt, how we deal with interrupts, um, how we write software for interrupts, then start to look at what's good and bad about interrupts before we start to go into a comparison with one alternative, which is polling, look at efficiency, and then uh, think about configuration. We should bear in mind that this is general principles. The actual way an interrupt works, the actual hardware and the configuration itself is very much microprocessor dependent. So when you look at the particular processor you're using, you will see the ins and outs of the particular registers you need to program. And, and there's always a little bit of flexibility there. But the general principles that remain, I will talk about in this section. So an interrupt is, is basically anything that interrupts the normal flow of program execution. Um, it's something that says to a microprocessor, it's an input that says, hey, something is happening and you need to do something about that immediately. So it's really like a request for action. It's like a student putting their hand up, or it's like somebody shouting for somebody else to get attention. Some examples will be a computer reset button. Often they're connected to an internal um, interrupt. Uh, I've got a, um, an example in the notes about a nuclear reactor. This is a classic example. When your nuclear reactor starts to increase in temperature, when it reaches a critical threshold, it will blow up. Um, generally what you do is you will insert control rods into a nuclear reactor to slow down the reaction. This would probably be under microprocessor control, hopefully uh, several microprocessors. And the request to lower the control rods needs to be handled very, very quickly. So no matter what the computer is doing, when the alarm comes in that there's an over-temperature condition, this thing needs to respond very quickly. There's, there's lots of other examples. I mean, anything you do with real time when you're playing games is handled by interrupts. Most telecommunications, uh, mobile phone use, is handled by interrupts. When you touch a touchscreen, type on a keyboard, or when you speak into a speech recognition system, there'll be interrupts involved. Now, Interrupts are good, so most computer people, we tend to be a little bit introverted, and when we think about interrupts, we think about somebody interrupting us, which we don't like. Extroverts actually like this. Well, microprocessors uh, use interrupts extensively, and if you don't have interrupts, you can't really do very much in a modern microprocessor. They are good. They are really useful. So the first one I mentioned was the reset button. Um, yes, you can unplug something and plug it back in again, but a reset button stops what the processor is doing and it restarts things from the beginning. That's how you understand a reset button, right? Now, think about what you know about how a CPU works. Now, when a CPU is executing its code, what it's doing is it's reading an instruction from memory, it's executing that instruction, then it's reading the next instruction, executing that instruction, reading the next instruction, executing that. So how does it know where to get those instructions from? Something called a program counter, PC for short. The program counter is a register that holds the address that points to the next instruction in the program. So if your program is operating sequentially, one instruction after another, then the program counter is counting upwards from the beginning to the next instruction to the next instruction to the next instruction to the next instruction. The next instruction. Um, usually we have a program that's, that operates like this. Uh, memory actually counts upwards when you step through a program, but it looks funny if you turn it the other way around. So what's actually happening when you press a reset button is instead of the program going from one instruction to the next, when you press the reset button it just says, oh hang on, I'm not going to get the next instruction, I'm going to branch back to the beginning again. That's what it's doing, and where it's going back to the beginning, it's called the reset interrupt vector. Okay. Now it turns out that there's a lot of interrupt vectors. There's so many that we call it a table, an interrupt vector table, or IVT. And whenever an interrupt occurs, any type of interrupt, not just the reset button, then the CPU responds by doing a few things, which we'll get to in a moment, 
and then jumping to a location in the interact vector table. And the interact vector table is a table in memory of software. And the software is basically the instructions that the programmer has given to the microprocessor, the instructions as to what it should do when it gets a particular interrupt. Okay. Usually, well, those instructions, the programmer says, okay, if you get this interrupt, then branch to an interrupt service routine to handle that interrupt. If you get a different kind of interrupt, then branch to a different interrupt service routine to handle that. The code, the interrupt service routine, the bit that handles the interrupts, that can be anywhere in memory. But the interrupt vector table tells the CPU if a particular interrupt occurs, which IVT and where in memory it should jump to, it should branch to. For a typical ARM um, CPU, the interrupt vector table looks something like this. Um, it starts from the bottom with address 0. And in fact, in a 32-bit processor, that would usually be address 0x0000000000. Zero 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 bottom of memory. And we can say that if we go up from the bottom of memory, uh, ignore the first thing for a moment, we've got reset, we've got NMI, we'll come to that in a moment, a bit higher up we've got various faults, and a bit higher up we've got system tick, and then IRQs, interrupt requests. Okay, So these are all names of things that can happen inside a CPU that would raise an interrupt. Right? So let's say that the thing happened inside a CPU that raised a bus fault. The CPU would respond by basically stopping what it was currently doing and jumping to this location in memory. So it sets the program counter to 0x0014 and that allows the CPU to read whatever is in this location and it would be something like branch to the bit of code that you should run when there's a bus fault. And the same for all of the signals in this table. Uh, at the top IRQ 0 to N, well it depends how many interrupt sources there are in a processor. N could be 1, 2, 40, 100. There's 100 interrupt devices. It really depends on the CPU itself. The ones down the bottom tend to be the ones that are responsing, uh, responses to errors, uh, or these things here that are sort of hard resets. And the ones at the top tend to be user ones where you are programming a peripheral and the peripheral needs to respond with an interrupt. We'll get to this later. There's quite a lot of text in my um, computer systems book about how interrupts work, and it's in section 6.5, page 341. It's worthwhile having a quick read of that, um, but I've taken an example on the next page that uh, just describes what happens when you get an interrupt in a very simple ARM processor. So, starting from the top, and the code is uh, beginning with branch start, and then the program runs down from there. So let me just go through this um, from 1 to 6, that's the numbers in the, the circles. The code starts, it branches to underscore underscore start, it happens to be the start point of most C programs. Item 1, following the orange arrows, the code is running normally, at underscore underscore start it doesn't add then a sub S, then a BEQ, it's branching to some place. Um, it doesn't really matter where it's branching to, but down here we've got some code, it's, it's a sub. So we follow the orange trace. When the orange trace ends, an interrupt request occurs. And that's the sort of pink sun shaped symbol just there, referred to down here. This is when the interrupt actually occurs. Up to this point, the processor has just been executing code as normal. The interrupt occurs. Okay, The CPU responds by saving the program counter, 
maybe a little bit more, we'll see in a moment, and then it jumps to the interrupt vector table location that handles this IRQ. Now in this processor, the place where the IRQ is handled is just, sorry, the place in the interrupt vector table where the IRQ is specified is just here. So when the interrupt occurs, the program counter is saved by the microprocessor, it stops what it's doing, and then it sets the IRQ address as the content of the PC, so the next instruction that's fetched is from just here. So instead of the program running sequentially as normal, it branches to just here, and then it reads this instruction which is a BISR1, it's a branch to ISR1, and then the CPU just branches down here to interrupt service routine 1. That's 4. This is the interrupt handler. ISR1 presumably handles the interrupt. Um, it doesn't really matter what it does again. But once the interrupt is handled, then there's a, a command down here which is a specific ARM command. It's to take the program counter from where it was stored and, um, and restore it. What that does is it jumps back to where the CPU had been executing from and it continues with the, the purple color just running the program as it was before. So put this in context, okay? The CPU is working, it's going step, 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 step through a program. At some point an interrupt request occurs, an interrupt signal says to the CPU, wait, you need to handle this. The CPU stops what it's doing, branches to the interrupt vector table. The interrupt vector table says branch to ISR. It branches to an ISR, handles the interrupt. When the ISR is finished, it goes back to where it left off and carries on as if nothing else had happened. That's the correct functioning of an interrupt. So, I said that when the interrupt occurs, the CPU does various things. It does certain things. Well, for the types of interrupts that you and I are going to use, this is normal interrupts that are connected to peripherals, before the CPU jumps to the vector table, it automatically stores its context, which could include many things, um, but usually that context includes the program counter and the status register. The status register is a register that says what was the um, state of the CPU, was the last instruction equ uh, result equal to zero, was it negative, or was it an overflow, or was it, did it have a carry? This is the status register. And some processors store other things. Um, some processors that I've used in the past, they would automatically take all the registers and store them away. They store the entire context before they handle the interrupt. So, in this first paragraph here, what it's saying is that for most interrupts, before the CPU jumps to the interrupt vector table, it just stores all this stuff. And the idea is that after you've handled the interrupt, you can just restore all that stuff and carry on where it left off. Okay. Some processors store all those registers, the context, in a special place. But in many processors, they store the context to a block of memory which is called the stack. Now, if you don't know what a stack is, it's a really simple, context, uh, a simple concept. It's a block of memory that's used for general purpose storage, short-term storage usually. And um, CPU instructions can push things onto the stack and then pop them off later. Um, it's a simple concept. I actually have a stack here. It's not a CPU stack, it's a stack of paper. I put things on my stack of paper, I push them on there, and later I pop them off again. Um, I say that the CPU must pop them off later. Why? Well, anybody that keeps a stack like mine will know that if you don't pop things off, eventually the stack gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And in the CPU, it will run out of memory. Unlike my stack of paper, the CPU has got something called a stack pointer, which is a, a special register that indicates the address of the last thing you put into the stack. So when you push something onto the stack, 
the stack pointer increments. You push something else onto the stack, stack pointer increments again, push something else onto the stack, it increments, and so on. The diagram here shows a stack which is partially used. The used bits are in dark. The stack pointer says that the last thing I put in was this. I push two more things to the stack, the stack gets bigger. The stack pointer increments. So it's a way of just keeping track of how much of the stack is used. And I will say again, if you're a programmer and you keep pushing things to the stack and you don't pop them off, you're going to run out of memory eventually. Not a good thing. So let's just recap what happens with interrupts. You've got a program, it's running normally, something interrupts it, and it's an interrupt signal. The CPU responds by saving the context. Generally, it pushes the um, program counter and the status register onto the stack. Then it branches to the interrupt vector table, which tells it to branch to an interrupt service routine, which actually services the interrupt. Once you've serviced the interrupt, once the, the ISR has serviced the interrupt, and it's done whatever the interrupt needs to do, then it restores context. It pops the stuff back from the stack and re resumes to wherever it left off at the beginning. You might think this is a, a strange way of doing things, um, but this has been here since this has been used since time immemorial in microprocessors. Um, it turns out to be a very efficient way of handling interrupts. Now, for example, you could have multiple interrupt service routines in memory. You don't need to change the interrupt service routines, but you just change what's in the interrupt vector table in order to enable or disable different features in the interrupts. It's a really good way of doing something. You could also have a single interrupt service routine that multiple interrupts jump to. And in that interrupt service routine, the first thing it might do is say, OK, which of those multiple interrupts actually occurred? This is very common, in fact. So this is a flexible way of doing things. Now we're going to talk about polling, um, and this is in particular, it's uh, an alternative to interrupt handling when you've got peripherals. And let's just run through this and see what it really means. We're going to do it from the context of imagining that you've got a peripheral. Uh, I've got an example of a 5G peripheral, but it could be anything. It could be a printer or a touchscreen or a mouse or whatever. And this 5G peripheral, um, it's connected to your CPU or your microprocessor via an interface that uses data address and control bus. And your programmer, so your task is to write a program to handle data packets that are received by this 5G network. I've told that I've said here that the um, 5G network is such that you need to process the received packets very quickly within one millisecond of them arriving. So the question here is, how do you get the data from the peripheral to your program? It's a very simple question. Let's see how we can do it. The first way is through polling. Now, the, um, the diagram up here shows your program, and your program is able to read from or write to the peripheral via an interface and a bus. So what polling is, is your program asks the peripheral, hey, peripheral, is there any data yet? Has a packet was arrived yet? And the peripheral is going to say, mm, yes or no. If no, your program says, oh, OK, I'll wait a bit. After a while, hey, peripheral, is there any packet yet? The peripheral says, no, your program goes away and waits a bit. OK, how about now? Is there any packet? And the peripheral says, yes. And your program says, whoa, yes, and handles that packet. That's polling. It's an infinite loop. It keeps on going around saying, is there data? Is there data? Is there data? It keeps waiting. The alternative is to do this using an interrupt. And it might look a little bit more complicated in the diagram, but it's, uh, it's not difficult to do in practice. 
So as a programmer, what you need to do, first of all, is you need to set up the interrupt controller in that CPU to say, please listen to the interrupt signal that comes from that peripheral. Now, most peripherals like this would have an interrupt signal. And you tell the interrupt controller, OK, um, when that peripheral's interrupt occurs, I want you to run this ISR. And you write an ISR. Now, your ISR could be pretty similar to the program you just wrote to try with polling. Then you, as the programmer, you write a program that just goes to sleep. You've set everything up, and then the program just goes to sleep. And it's safe in the knowledge that that program will be woken up when needed. In fact, what happens? The peripheral does nothing until the packet comes in. It receives a wireless packet. As soon as it gets that packet, it interrupts the CPU. It says, oh, I've got some data. The CPU interrupt controller says, oh, that's a uh, interrupt signal from the 5G peripheral. Um, who is handling that? It goes and looks in the interrupt vector table, and it finds an address of an ISR which it branches to. And that ISR is the code that you wrote. It's designed to handle the packet from the 5G peripheral. Your ISR then says to the 5G peripheral, OK, I know you've got a packet. Give me the packet. Give it to me, and I'll handle it. Your ISR handles that packet, and then it goes to sleep again, and it waits for the next packet. So the polling is often called a busy wait process. It wastes precious CPU time saying, have you got something yet? Have you got something yet? Have you got something yet? And the worst case latency, that means that the longest time you have to wait depends on the polling cycle. I mean, the worst case is you ask the peripheral, have you got a packet yet? The peripheral says no. And then a nanosecond later, the peripheral gets a packet. But it can't do anything because it has to wait for your code. OK, how about now? Have you got a packet? It has to wait that length of time. That's the worst case latency. And the problem is, if you have a peripheral you need to respond to very quickly, it means that your program needs to ask very frequently, have you got a packet yet? No. Have you got a packet yet? No. And that wastes even more CPU time. But interrupts are so much more energy efficient. The CPU can go to sleep. Sleep is a low power mode. And they're faster. As soon as a packet comes in, an interrupt is raised, suddenly the CPU wakes that ISR and handles that peripheral. Now, I've said that the ISR could be very similar to the program that you had for polling. Yes, it can. But you don't have to do it all in an ISR. You can actually have exactly the same program that you used to have for, pro for polling. Just put a sleep in there. And instead of the ISR handling the packet, the ISR wakes the program to handle the packet. It might seem that this is um, a little bit more involved, but it, it's a good way to go when your program is in, um, it's, it's quite a large program where it does something which is quite slow. We'll see that in a moment. I've got a page here that says that um, polling is much less efficient than interrupts. Um, we've got T is the fastest possible time between events interrupt occurring. D is the deadline by which you must service that interrupt. P is the polling period if you're doing polling. C is the CPU time it takes to handle that interrupt. That will be the same whether you're doing polling or interrupts. And H is the hardware response time. That's how long it takes the hardware to respond to an interrupt. In practice, um, it's, it's the yellow bit in the diagram down here. In practice, it would be so small that you can't even see it. It's very, very quick. But I've drawn it big just for the sake of the diagram. And we define utilization as how much of the CPU does this use. Well, polling uses C over P of the CPU, um, the polling period. If you want the polling period to be short, because you need to handle it, the um, peripheral very quickly, then what happens is the utilization, that's the amount of CPU you're using, goes up. 
the interrupt utilization is actually much less because it only depends on t when the interrupt actually occurs and we've got some constraints so um, you can work through these for polling um, 2c must be less than or equal to c plus p which must be less than or equal to the deadline which must be less than or equal to the worst case timing the fastest timing and for interrupts it's slightly different um, h plus c must be less than or equal to the deadline which must be less than or equal to the worst case timing so this is um, h plus c is, is what's shown here uh, c is your code so for interrupts really the amount of efficiency in your interrupt handling code is the main factor that you can influence that basically means that the, the performance depends on how good your code writing is but for the polling we've got different things we've got your code writing skills here and we also got p which is how often you'll run your code how often you'll repeat the request for um, polling the peripheral it shows that actually interrupts are simpler they have less constraints but when you look at the numbers that are on here h is usually very very tiny it shows that interrupts are much more efficient I've said this uh, in not so many words but in summary because the ISR code needs to um, run quickly and it could run very frequently it must be tiny it must be fast and efficient if you have a big piece of ISR code it could slow down your CPU a lot interrupts by their very nature they're coming from outside a CPU they're unpredictable uh, they could happen at almost any time um, one particular thing to think about is re-entrant so do you allow an interrupt to occur while the CPU is still handling the previous interrupt uh, it's more difficult to write re-entrant code it's much easier to write code where an interrupt occurs you quickly handle it and then make sure that that's handled before the next interrupt occurs that's easier sometimes it's not possible most interrupt signals and all interrupt signals from peripherals can be masked that means that you turn them off in software but some of these interrupts are non-maskable non so reset is usually a non-maskable interrupt you can't write a bit of software that ignores the reset button on most processors those big errors like bus error or memory error floating point error these are also non-maskable initially um, CPUs had just one or two interrupt signals but today they are full of different on-chip peripherals and each of those peripherals ha probably has an interrupt and some of them could have many interrupt signals so a modern single chip or system on chip processor might have hundreds of interrupt sources internally and most of those would be handled by software especially if you use a high level operating system like embedded Linux they're all handled automatically so when you write an ISR you write the code to handle the interrupt that's specific to whatever the interrupt is so if it's a 5G peripheral you write code to handle 5G packets but before you leave the ISR before you finish the ISR you must restore the state of the CPU because after you finish your interrupt service routine the CPU is going to go back to doing what it did what it was doing initially when you triggered the interrupt so you need to be able to restore its state restore its context some CPUs do this automatically but not all you probably have to tidy up basically another thing is if your CPU has had an interrupt and that interrupts caused an ISR to run um, what's actually happening is when the CPU gets an interrupt it usually triggers something internally the CPU says whoa interrupt it triggers an interrupt flag and the interrupt flag will be a bit that's high that says an interrupt has occurred and that bit will stay high until your ISR has finished and then it will clear that bit to say I've handled this interrupt if you forget to clear the interrupt flag then your ISR will finish you go back to the code and the CPU will say hey, hey that interrupt flag is still high nobody's cleared it it must need servicing 
so your interrupt service routine will get to run again and have another chance to service that interrupt. ISRs really should be standalone code. They use global variables so they can access information in memory, but you can't pass parameters into an ISR. Uh, that's not entirely true if you use a high-level language. In a high-level language, when you write an interrupt service routine, there are parameters that can be passed to it. But on a low-level microprocessor, you consider that you cannot pass anything into it. Nested interrupts are uh, where one, pro uh, one interrupt occurs, an interrupt service routine is servicing that, and a second interrupt occurs. The first interrupt service routine itself is interrupted. So we know you can interrupt a piece of software, a piece of your code, but it turns out you can also interrupt an interrupt. I know that sounds crazy. And for interrupting interrupts, there's something called interrupt priorities. Usually in software, you give each interrupt a priority. Sometimes it's fixed, sometimes it's something you can program. And in general, a higher priority interrupt can interrupt a lower priority one. For people who are new to interrupts, I would say never put an infinite loop into an ISR. You will hang the processor in most CPUs. So in software, in low-level software, uh, once you've written an interrupt service routine, you set up the interrupt vector table with the address, the location in memory of your interrupt service routine. Then you enable the interrupt in the interrupt controller of your CPU. Finally, you tell the peripheral, OK, if you need to contact me, raise an interrupt. And then you unmask the interrupt in your CPU, and you're all ready. When you program interrupts, you'll find out that they can be edge-triggered or level-triggered. Um, if level-triggered, when the interrupt occurs, um, it's just whether the signal is high or low, because you can change the, the polarity often of interrupts. Um, an interrupt which is edge triggered, what will happen is as that either drops, as the input signal drops, or the input signal rises, it will set the interrupt flag. Because interrupts are not part of normal code execution, you will find that they're actually really difficult to debug. Um, if you're into debugging and you're trying to solve problems in a big project, then sometimes interrupts are the worst ones to solve. Another reason why you should keep your interrupt service routine, ISR code, as tiny as possible, because there's less chance that you've included an error. So let's just recap what we covered. We looked at different types of interrupts, what they are, whether they're maskable or non-maskable. We looked at how you handle interrupts, and that includes having an interrupt service routine and then interrupt vector table. When the interrupt occurs, the CPU stops what it's doing and goes to the interrupt vector table to find out where and how it should handle an interrupt. That usually branches to an interrupt service routine to do the actual handling. We talked about the advantages and disadvantages of interrupts, especially with regard to polling. We just a little bit about efficiency, utilization, and then we started to think about interrupt configuration. And I'll leave this just by mentioning something I said at the beginning, and that is that it's all very much CPU dependent. Uh, different CPUs all handle interrupts in this basic way, but the details vary. Like where the interrupt vector table is, what you do inside an interrupt service routine, how much, if any, context gets stored. Does it get stored to stack or does it get stored to somewhere else? And how do you return from an interrupt? How do you restore the context afterwards? The interrupt numbers, the interrupt locations, and their priorities, and how you mask them, how you enable them, are also very much CPU specific. But the general principles, the important general principles for this topic that makes CPUs interact with the real world in real time, this remains true across virtually all CPUs you will ever come across. So happy interrupt programming. Thank you.